I'm one of those kids who never read fiction. I just thought there was so much more in nonfiction. And to me, inventing a new technology, discovering a new phenomenon, um, discovering a new piece of science, they're just a lot of fun and you're playing with real life mysteries as opposed to some hypothetical mystery you make up. So I've always been intrigued and fascinated by learning and new science and new discoveries. And, and frankly, innovation is about taking all that science knowledge which we've developed and using it for the benefit of uh, mankind. So I'm very intrigued by the notion that social change happens not in small increments, but in massive change. Uh, massive runaway phenomena. Uh, when a small temperature difference in the ocean can turn into a hurricane, that, that's pretty stunning. Um, a little thing to the left or right can cause revolution in a nation or in a marketplace. Um, the financial crisis was a negative black swan. Uh, a series of bad mortgage things that seemed perfectly okay in July of 2008 became massive crises by September, October, and nobody recognized it. It's that kind of change, this rapid, significant, mostly unpredictable change is what a black swan is. And I think the world is full of positive technology black swans. The financial crisis was a negative black swan. The green revolution that started feeding most of the world was a positive black swan. Uh, and there's many more positive black swans to be had. Nobody expected Google, it's a black swan. Facebook, it's a Twitter, these are all black swans. The Apple iPhone is a black swan. Can we have a black swan technology to replace oil? Absolutely. Can we have a black swan technology to change the nature of our electricity source? Absolutely. Uh, my belief is the really effective technologies, the ones that really take over the world, are not going to be incre incremental improvements in solar cell efficiency or wind efficiency. It'll be something radical, something new, something unexpected. The definition of a black swan is something highly improbable, massive impact, and retrospective, but not prospective predictability. And I think the technology world, the innovation world is full of black, positive black swans, and I'm a religious believer in these. Well, when you innovate in technology, you can gain significant advantages. Frankly, most often with small amounts of money. Large innovation never comes from the big companies. General Electric is in the lighting business. In fact, their logo is a lamp. They didn't innovate in LED lighting. A company like Creed did. Nobody's heard of it. BP and Solar Shell were big investors in solar cells. Well, the success came to two little companies called SunPower and First Solar. Um, you look at wind, almost all the really innovative wind stuff happened in startups, not in the big companies. Uh, same thing is happening with biofuels. In fact, the big companies may be spending lots of money on biofuels, the oil companies. They may be spending even more money advertising what they're doing in biofuels but not one of those technologies would fit in the top 10 most interesting technologies for biofuels, for replacing oil. Um, in fact, Lanza Tech, a New Zealand company that we backed, with very small amounts of money, has completely changed the rules around biofuel. They make ethanol from flue gases of steel mills. Who would have imagined that? And in fact, if a big company executive had proposed it to his board, he would have been laughed out of the room. And that's why almost all innovation, the black swans come from little companies. Google didn't come from uh, big media companies like NBC or CBS. It came from two young PhDs at Stanford. Facebook happened, came from a 23-year-old. 
And so over and over, we see this model of innovation coming from little, small efforts. To your original question, technology innovation happens best with very small amounts of money and very experienced, intelligent, and most often really creative technologists, scientists, who are trying something different. Not massive amounts of money spent on a predefined vision. Mostly innovation happens in the one year or less. Big companies can't even plan in that horizon. So it's the scientists, people like Sean Simpson, who started Lonzo Tech, who come up with a great idea, do just enough to prove it, just enough to get the next set of financial support to try the next set of experiments. That's the nature of technology innovation and where it comes from. Well, more than anything else, we look for brilliant entrepreneurs. And mostly in the seed fund, they're brilliant scientists, entrepreneurs, they're technologists, entrepreneurs. In fact, Sean Simpson would be the prototypical one. The original email he sent me with a two-page proposal would not have fit any business school metric of a business plan. It was a bad idea, badly done, badly written, badly presented. But the science and the person behind it came through very clearly. It was clear he had good ideas, he had an ambitious goal, and he knew his stuff. He knew his science and could potentially do this project of, as ridiculous as it sounds, producing fuels from the flue gases of steel mills. Um, and I saw that nugget and decided to support him. Um, and, and that's um, how it generally happens. You know, in the very, very early stages, it is sometimes a good idea. My only worry is most of your family and friends don't understand the risks they're taking and you don't want them to be ex-friends or ex-family if you get it wrong. Very often technology projects don't work the first time. The idea may be brilliant, but it may take 10 passes at it to get it right, to get it to work as advertised. And so proving out a concept with very small amounts of money, whether you do it on sweat equity or with a little bit of family or friend support, probably works that science experiment in the garage. But eventually, building a successful company is not just about the technology. And when you come to investors like us, you can get help in all sorts of other ways. There's probably 10 factors responsible for building a successful business. And the technology is one, two, or three of those. Even picking markets is difficult. So when you have a great idea, in a great market. You can get a little bit of help to prove that you have some technology that's unique and differentiated, or at least some ideas that might bear fruit. Eventually, you want professional support to help you pick the markets, how to enter the markets after you pick them, and most people don't realize how complex and nuanced these decisions are, how to hire the other people that fit into your team, because nothing happens without the right team. And if you're a technical scientist or a technologist, you don't know what a good marketing person is. You don't even know what a good market is and why it may or may not make sense. And that's the kind of thing you want help on from professional investors who can help you with all that. Well, the countries that have less structured more exploratory science, uh, mostly at the universities, do really well. Um, you, know, you take two contrasts. America does really well because the university system is so independent and so unstructured that all kinds of crazy ideas get tried. 
You take a country like Germany at the other end, and it's equally sophisticated in its science and technology, and almost no innovation happens in Germany. They're very good at engineering, they're very good at exports, they're very good at old businesses and precision machining and things that don't require a lot of innovation but require discipline. And the German system does pretty well at that, but they don't do very well at innovating new ideas. Hardly uh, any important clean tech technology is coming out of Germany. And because it's such a structured, disciplined system, and you want the exact opposite, a little bit of chaos, uh, a little bit of fun, a lot of fashion, uh, short-term plans, not long-term plans. Anything that means long-term plans means it probably is a waste of money when it comes to innovation uh, because you can't predict things. And so I do think uh, the, the, those cultural differences are very important. When I first got an email, even though it was wrapped in wrappings that were very unattractive from a business plan point of view, the, I love the nugget of an idea behind the, behind the science. And when I looked at how flexible and versatile it could be, it could not only produce ethanol, it could do specialty chemicals, it could work with steel mill flue gases or other flue gases, it could work with stranded natural gas reformed into syngas, it could work with biomass to convert biomass into fuels and chemicals. It was very flexible technology. But frankly, what sealed the deal for me was talking to Sean. I loved his approach as a scientist, as an entrepreneur. Um, I, I just got enamored with Sean and said, we got to do this. I think it's absolutely critical to growing an economy to have investment in science and technology. Far more, other than education, far more than almost anything else. Um, you know, I saw a statistic a while ago, it was a while ago, that said 40% of GDP growth in the United States is coming from innovation in technology. That's a very large percentage. Um, in, and I do think that's important for every country. You know, today, 500 million people enjoy what I call an energy-rich lifestyle, mostly in the Western world. We have air conditioners, we have heating in our homes, we have running water, we drive automobiles and fly in airplanes, all of them very energy intensive. Uh, the fact is, over the next 30 years or 40 years, five billion more people will want that same energy-rich lifestyle. It creates a wonderful opportunity to create new technologies and with it, new companies that can grow an economy, providing these. And frankly, of all the things we can do, and we can save and be more efficient and conserve more, it's not going to matter. What matters is technology that multiplies the world's resources. And we've done this over and over again. The Green Revolution, as I mentioned before, multiplied the productivity of land. We produce seven times more corn per acre today than we did 50 years ago. There's no question we can have an engine go five times further on the same oil. And so need 80% less oil. We know we can come up with radical new batteries that are actually cost effective and work for electric cars and hybrids. Today, most of the efforts are incremental. Um, and so multiplying the world's resources is the most important need the next 50 years as 5 billion more people want this energy rich lifestyle that'll only happen through science and technology innovation. And hence this investment is not only important to growing an economy, it's the only thing that'll work. My personal view is commercialization is about generating passion. I've seldom seen simple licenses work. We license a technology, it dies, because whoever adapts it has no passion for it. 
when a great scientist working in a government lab can not only develop the technology, but has the passion to then take it out and go with it. And his government job, for example, allows him to take a one or two year sabbatical. So he can go not only take the technology out, but take his passion for the technology out and build a team that can pick up that passion and continue that passion uh, and imbibe the team with his passion. And then maybe come back uh, to his old government job. That's the way to commercialize these technologies. And it's almost always with little companies, little startups, not with large companies. Now governments are terrible at picking which companies to fund, um, but they can make it easier, reduce the risk for a scientist who wants to leave his government job or university job for a year or two and come back. That's the kind of thing I think that will encourage innovation and experimentation. And many a great technology has died because it was licensed and it went outside as a technology minus the passion. And so passion is the key to commercializing these innovations. Well, first, when entrepreneurs start worrying about the wrong things. Um, when I read a business plan, it says IPO on the first page, I tend to just drop it. Because that's not the goal. It's to commercialize a technology and use it in some really beneficial way in the marketplace. You know, Apple is a great example. Steve Jobs doesn't care what the PC business is doing, what the cell phone business is doing. He just cares about producing insanely great products for consumers. And the rest takes care of itself. And that's what I recommend to all entrepreneurs. Get passionate about what the benefit you're providing, not about the financials, not about IPOs, not about the money you'll make, and you'll get through lots of barriers. And in the end, that's what will make, make an entrepreneur successful. Of course, the other piece of that is no entrepreneur is good enough to do everything that needs to be done in taking a technology and commercializing it. Teams have to be built. And entrepreneurs seldom know what constitutes a good team. What's a good marketing person? What's a good CEO? What's a good market? And so getting the right help is very important too. And for an entrepreneur to know, know not only what he knows, but to know what he doesn't know and where he really needs help and may not even know who to ask for help. Um, those are important for an entrepreneur. The only prediction I have is that nobody can make a prediction. The nature of technology, especially the more important technologies I talk about, the black swans, they're fundamentally only retrospectively predictable which is an oxymoron. And so I don't think we can predict the path of technology. Who could have predicted Twitter just three years ago? Who could have predicted one of the most valuable country, companies in the world, Google, 10 years ago? You couldn't have. There were two graduate students in the science, computer science department at Stanford. Um, and so all kinds of surprising things happen. And that's the very nature of this. And I do say, one thing we can do is encourage more shots on goal. Um, you know, we take more shots on goal, we're more likely to be successful.